Well, our internet group and my brothers and sisters that are here with me in the mornings to hear the word of God and just have a little fellowship and pray for the needs of uh, family and people we know and friends. We're in Deuteronomy 14, and what a wonderful journey this has been. It just seems like the other day we started, we ended Numbers, we go into Deuteronomy, and as I said, these books are precious. Today is chapter 14, 14, 15, 16, 17. They roll together in the instruction book, gives us a, a great understanding of God's heart, his will, and how we can make spiritual adjustments even in our own lives to draw closer to God by listening closely to the word of God today. Because this is Old Testament. Old Testament brings us to grace. And man, I, I take my hand over my head and some of you could see me, I just wipe my, my forehead because woo, you know, if we had to obey everything that we're reading in the Old Testament, we'd be a little crazy at the end of it all because it never ends. And this morning, I pray that everybody here gets something. I mean, even dietary, the food, uh, near the end of the read, it talks about the laws regarding tithing. I mean, God so if God's talking about tithing, he's been talking about it in the other chapters. It's just part of worship with God, giving back so that others can have. And, and, and that's why modern Christianity has really blown it out of proportion, because these people are living high on the hog in plain English. They're not worried about the poor. When you, when you get into the scriptures and you listen to what Jesus said to the rich man, you would understand what phony baloney is with a lot of these modern preachers that are hoarding millions of dollars in bank accounts and properties. They can't take it with them. There's no reward for doing that. The reward is doing what God said to do. And if you focus on the gospel, God said to the rich man, go sell everything you have and follow me. There aren't one of these people that can do that. And, you know, it's okay to have some money for a rainy day. I, you know, we all do. The little bit I have, if the banks close tomorrow, I'm as broke as anybody else on the planet. And I'm not hoarding money in my home to worry about tomorrow because God says, don't worry. You know, to be absent from the body is present in the Lord. We all get to die. So many people fear death. I, I've been around so many Christians that are afraid to die. And when you die, you got a homecoming going on. So let's do it here. Self-disfigurement prohibited is the subtitle in the Thomas Nelson today. Chapter 14, Deuteronomy. And here is what we're being told again this morning in God's word. What a beautiful way it starts. Ye are, that's us the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. You know, when I was younger and I read this, I was like, wow. God is so peculiar, because we're supposed to be a peculiar people. We're supposed to, and you know, I understand. I understand grace and mercy. I understand. I've prayed with many people even with tattoos over the years. I myself have never gotten a tattoo. Uh, that's something that the devil couldn't trick me into. I, I just knew why are people cutting themselves and taking ink and drawing things. And, and, and sometimes they're putting dead people on their, their, their bodies. And you know, that was a thing I, I, growing up, I witnessed with military people traveling away from their families, and they needed something to comfort them. You know, and I see Christians today writing Jesus, but there's another Jesus spirit in the world. Is he the Jesus that commands us to be meek and humble? 
or is it the Jesus that a lot of people lie to with the prosperity gospel? There's a lot of people telling people, if you don't give me money, you're cursed. And you're going to learn what the tide was originally used for in this chapter today. You know, it's for taking care of God's people. Far cry from what it is today. Even today in deliverance, people want to get paid by the hour. Or there's ministries that want you to give them a credit card before they even pray with you. You know, it wasn't that way with the 700 Club when that started years back. You could call in and they'd say a prayer with you. But what I noticed about a lot of television ministries over the years is they all want money from you. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. You know, when you really get into reading the book. So that first verse, I want to read it again. Ye are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art, listen to what he says in verse 2, to his people. He says, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord had chosen thee to be a peculiar person or people unto himself. God covets our spiritual relationship with the word of God. You know, if you're a true believer, you hear what the word of God says and you, you put it into action. That's as simply as you activate God's word in our lives. So above all the nations that are upon the earth, we are got, we're going to be called the peculiar people. Regarding the clean and the unclean, and, and this is in the, the level of food, meat, and, and God, you know, he's the creator. If you don't want to believe what the creator says, I, I can understand, but I don't want to be disobedient. I just want to hearken. Some things could be good for us and some things can be bad for us. I've learned that, you know, I've learned, and you know, I was in the seafood industry for a long time. But my body has a problem a lot of times, and I, I was getting gout attacks like you wouldn't believe, because I was eating a lot of shellfish, a lot of lobster, a lot of shrimp, a lot of purines, different things. So I didn't know it in the beginning. I learned as the pain came into my body, and I was like a cripple for many years, that there are some things that might be good for us and some things that our body cannot handle. And everybody's different. I've seen skinny people eat tons of cake and ice cream and never get a gain a pound. If I eat anything with sugar, I put on a pound. You know, different strokes for different folks. But here in, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14 today, this is God speaking to everybody. Now you can either trust and believe or don't believe. God doesn't make any one of us uh, an, uh, like we got to do. He's not programming us. He gave us a choice, a will to either follow God or disobey God. I choose in my life right now to follow the Lord because I spent a lot of years not following God. And I'm I'm out of a lot of my turbulence, so to speak, in my spiritual walk, and I'm really having a good time walking with God every day. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. And then he goes on in four, these are the beasts which you shall eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the hart, the roebuck, the fallow deer, the wild goat, and the Pi carrot and the wild ox and the shamals or shamois and every beast that parted the hook and cleaveth the cleft unto two claws and cheweth the cud among the beast that ye shall eat. And I always refer to the chewing of the cud and like the cows out there in the pasture to us chewing on the 
spiritual food, the word of God. Sometimes we got to read it over and over again. Sometimes we got to meditate on God's word to get the fullness of God's word. So just like the physical food, God gives us the spiritual food, brothers and sisters. Nevertheless, verse seven, these shall not Eat, you shall not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the cloven hoof as the camel. And he uses the different things, the hair, the cooney, for they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean unto you. You know, and I, I, I think about how back in the law and by what they what God was trying to show everybody that the he had to set some parameters for God's chosen people to begin to trust and obey him remember there was a lot of pagans a lot of heathens he didn't want them intermarrying there were all kinds of things because why this god that was speaking here wanted us to obey him he was different. He wasn't part of the many gods. He claimed and he told his people, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you really understand the Old Testament and how it really is, when we get to the, the second covenant, the, the one that's ratified in the blood of God's only begotten son, you begin to see how much God loves his creation. And that's important. And, and nevertheless, you shall not eat of them that chew the cud, for they chew the cud, but divide on, not unto the hoof. Therefore, God's telling us here that this group is unclean. Now, when you get into the New Testament, there's some things God tolerates, and there's a lot of things he doesn't tolerate. And the New Testament is the spiritual. That's where we're called into, like Jesus told the Pharisee, Nicodemus. And I, I focused a lot on that because I've been discussing that with people outside the prayer group. Now, Nicodemus, the Apostle Paul, these guys all knew the law. They were scholars of the law. And yet Jesus, our Lord, called them all hypocrites told them they were serving their father, the devil, because their hearts weren't connected to God. Today, we're to love God with our whole heart. It said it back here in the old, but they had the law, and they put the law above the heart. And there's a lot of people today in churches that their heart's not connected to God, you know? And the churches are full of people like that. And there's there's so many different interpretations when there's only one way, the way that the Lord taught us here in the New Testament, but we can compare it all with the old, if you understand what I'm saying this morning. And, and the swine, remember, the Jews got mad when the demons went into the swine in the New Testament. But back here, he says in the swine, because it divided the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you, you shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. And you know, they were really strong words here that God was giving to the Israelites. These ye shall eat of all that are in the waters. And, and you know, this really touched me because I was in the fish business for 30 years. It says, those you shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales, shall ye eat. Today, you don't find too many Jewish people that'll eat lobster and shrimp. And then I always call them the make-believe Jews, because I know plenty of Jewish people that eat shrimp and lobster and crab. You know, we're living in a time where just about anything goes. And thank God for grace. Because God's got the solution in the New Testament. We can pray over our food and, and believe that if we, and, and you know, I always say it, I, I go out to eat as much as anybody else, I think. What I don't see 
in dining out is people ever really bowing their head and praying or even praying over their food. And I've been to many, many different occasions in my day, even as a Christian, where I have to interrupt the crowd and say, can I pray for the food? Because there's a lot of people that call themselves believers, but they don't take a moment to thank God for the blessing. And that's, you know, I can't say that about all, some of us that are in, in some of the ministries we've all been involved in because we're kind of like a peculiar group of people and and we're not religious we just try to follow the word of god brothers and sisters and in verse 10 this morning because then he goes on to the birds and and i these are the do's and don'ts in the old testament and there's a lot of it over the next few chapters the, and he says, and whatsoever hath not fins and scales, you may not eat. So God's pretty clear here. Fins and scales, you can eat all you want. And I think it's kind of funny that the, the disciples were the laborers that were working on fishing boats. And God said, hey, you're out there fishing. Now I'm going to have you fishing for men and women. You know, and what a character God is, because he 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 makes things happen in His will. Even when He chose that first group of men, and they spent a few years with Him, according to Scripture. And you know, when you hang out with something and it seems to be working, it's like if you plant yourself in a a, a camp of believers that believes in deliverance. Just like the sister that called me yesterday, she's learning about deliverance. And she said to me, she says, uh, pray for me. I'm going to pray with another woman over a woman tomorrow. And we'll probably be praying three or four hours. And I said, God bless you and go serve the Lord. That's all you can tell people. Of all the clean birds, now we go to the bird section. Of all clean birds, you shall eat. But these are those which you shall not eat, the eagle, the ostrich, the offspray, the glebe, the kite, and the vulture of, after his kind, because there's, there's all kinds of vultures out there. That's because they're preying on dead animals, you know, and it might not be healthy for a human body, I guess. But I, I just read the word of God, and I acknowledge this is God speaking to people. He had a reason for saying it. Today, today we're in a whole different planet when it comes to the Old Testament to the New, because we don't have to do the offerings every day. Believing in Christ, he did it one time for all that believe. He's our Savior. He is the Messiah. Even the demons hate his name. They know that the Word of God that we read is the truth that they have to submit to the written word of God, even though they don't want to. You just got to be radical about your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So listen to what God says here. And every raven after this kind, the owl, the night hawk, the uh, kako, or the hawk after his kind, or I could say kuko, the little owl and the great owl and the swan, the pelican, the gear eagle and the cormorant and the stork and the heron after her kind and the lapwing and the bat. You know, after the Wuhan thing, I don't think anybody wants to even deal with bats. You know, all a bat is to me is a flying rat. That's what it looks like to me. I've seen bats in the belfry over here at the old church we were. They eat the insects, Sharon says. So God created everything for a purpose, brothers and sisters. And then, and every creeping thing that flieth is unclean to you. I don't think we want to feast on flies, you know. They shall not be eaten. 
So that's pretty direct in, in today's read. But of all clean fowls, you may eat. And, and you know, that's why there's hunting today and ducks and goose and all these kind of birds that God created are okay to eat. And you shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself. Thou shalt give it unto the stranger that is in thy gates, that he may eat it or thou mayest sell it to an alien. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see it a kid in his mother's milk. And, you know, when I go to the commentary, it really goes a little deeper than I'm speaking right now. And, and that's why I always tell people there's nothing wrong with reading good commentaries. You'll glean from a multitude of counselors. Just don't take one as the gospel. You know, learn to rightly divide even commentaries and that God's given us all the Holy Spirit and he, he pretty much can guide us in wisdom and knowledge if we diligently seek him. And, and there's so many good uh, things in our day. As I can say, someone sent me something the other day. I listened to the brother and someone asked me an opinion on the brother. And I said, well, I need to listen to some more of his stuff to see where his heart is and what he really believes in. You know, you can't judge a person by one sermon. You know, everybody has a good day and everybody has a bad day. You don't know what people have on their, their mind or anything else. And the laws regarding tithing. And this is the part that really, when I was younger, really turned me around in a lot of ways. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. Listen to what God's saying here. But he also brings it into money later on. He says, the field that bringeth forth year by year, that's your crops. And usually when you're harvesting a field, it's food. I mean, that's as simple as it can be. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in a place which shall he shall choose to place his name there. And the tithe of, and this is where it's food, the corn, the wine, and the oil, and the firstlings of thy herds. Remember, all these herds that we can eat chewed the cud. They were living off the fields. When you see what goes on even in farming today, you get a better understanding of the purpose and why God created all these things. You know, and I've met many people over the years that raise goats, milk the goats, the cows. You know, there's some sisters that I've gotten to know, and some of them are still doing that kind of work. And the firstlings of the herds and the flocks that thou mayest learn. And what is it? The fear of the Lord God always. In other words, you're going to understand this and you're going to understand that it's God's truth. And that's important. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose his name, when the Lord thy God had blessed thee. So in other words, all good blessings come from above. God makes the rain, the sun, and everything that enables any crops to grow. That's why back in Genesis, he said all herb is good because he, he gave it to us to ingest, to eat, to be part of us. You know, and I can understand this as I'm, I'm getting older and I'm understanding the, the value of God's creation and how everything is, is been made by God to supply all of our needs. And you'd be surprised how, how just the simplicity of creation can keep people alive, brothers and sisters, even as he did with the manna and the water in the wilderness. 
And, and it says to set his name there, the last part of 24, when the Lord thy God had blessed thee, and thou shalt turn it into money. Here's the spot that I, I'm bringing up about money because there's an abundance and it's like anything. People trade, people barter in our world today. Money has become a driving force, it seems, in our world today. And it's the love of money that can be a driving force course not that we god knew what we needed before he created everything and everything is designed by god to work for god's plan for man and the more i read my bible and the more i look at these old testament verses i get a better understanding and he says here in verse 25 today then shall thou turn it into money and bind up the money in thine hand well for many years i used to bind up money in my hand, put it in my, my pocket, and I thought who I was, and that was the wrong interpretation of money, you know. At times, I was very prideful about how much I bound up in my hand, and, and I, I've been in deliverance long enough to hear people screaming at me, I want more money, not them, the demons in them. So there is a, a break point about money in the Bible. And we, we have to be diligent in studying, you know, just like he said to the rich man, take everything you got, go sell it and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. You know, I think it'd be hard for anybody that's used to having money in their pocket to just give it all up and follow Christ. Could you imagine what it was like in the beginning of the church? Jesus sent them out. I, I reflect on all this when I'm reading the Bible. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusted after, for oxen, sheep. So you can use the money to buy. And now it brings in another uh, part of the Bible that it's in here. So it's got to be there for a reason. And it says strong drink. Well, they didn't have pharmacia back then. They had strong drink. They used it like an anesthesia. And if you really study what went on in wars and everything else, and as the book of Proverbs tells us when we can use strong drink and when we shouldn't, because there's an evil of it. It changes a person's character. And, and you know, when you really get into understanding the word of God, God teaches us so that maybe we can control our behavior and what we're doing with God's creation sometimes, because it says strong drink or whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat therefore before the Lord, Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thy household. Now it talks about the Levite who are serving God in the tabernacle. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he had no part nor inheritance with thee, because the Levites were separated by God to only serve God in the tabernacle. So they were a special kind of person, and God wanted them taken care of. So I can understand partially that the needs of everybody can be met through the blessings of God. And at the end of three years, he said here, verse 28, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thy increase the same year and shall lay it up within the gates. And he closes this chapter, verse 29 and says in the Levite, because he had no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, now he's bringing in the stranger, now he's bringing in the orphan, the fatherless, and now he's bringing in the widow. And, it, and we all know that the religion that God the Father sees is pure and holy, is aiding widows and orphans or orphans and widows as it's been taught in the new testament so god's heart 
is still being filled, some of it in the old, into the grace of the New Testament. And it's not about works. It's about just being obedient to God, brothers and sisters. It's not works of salvation. That was done by Christ alone, you know. Our faith in Christ, believing that he died for our sins, is the passport into heaven. There is no other way. That's why Christ said, I'm the truth, the way, and the life. So it says here in 29, and the Levite, because he had no part, no inheritance with thee, and the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, which are within thy gates, because all these kind of people are within reach to all of us, even today. There's widows, there's orphans, there's strangers. That means there's got to be uh, an above the abundance. There's a, a part God put aside for other people that didn't have. That's why in the New Testament, he says, the poor will always be with us. You know? And God says they're blessed. Read your Bibles. And why are they blessed? Because God commands the blessings, even out of all of us, to give something forward to help others. You know, my, my wife has always been a, a promoter of charity. She talks to me about that all the time when we're just having conversation. With the little that you have, the little extra you can always give to help somebody else. And which are within the gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, that's our hands, which thou doest. So always remember God when you're reading Old Testament and apply it with some of the stuff God tells us to do, you know, you don't forsake the law. It's the heart and the mindset of our creator. And he shows us that, that if we come into obedience, that's why all scriptures for teaching and training, you don't live the law. That's, that's not what God wants. He wants us to understand who he is. And that's why all scriptures for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness, in the commentary this morning, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 12, deal with a diet for God's people. We have in this chapter regulations that may be a little clearer than those that were in Leviticus. The reason for this is the dietary law recorded in Leviticus has now been tested during the wilderness, the 40 years in the wilderness, for 40 years. And in, in between it all, you know, as it, he, he, the Word of God teaches us today in the first two verses, we're called holy. We're not to disfigure ourselves. These are the heathen pagan practices in that day. Back then, that's what they did. We see the carryover among certain tribes on the earth today who still disfigure their faces it's part of their worship, a part of their religion. God's people were never to do anything like what we witness today. And, and you know what? That's a real, the bloodletting that's going on even here in the world today is out of control, people. It's not the way God created anybody. I'm not going to argue with people because you're going to be arguing against God. When you're trying to prove a point, like some people do, well, tattoos are okay, I can have whatever I want. Well, not if you're reading the Word of God. I, I've, I've interrogated demons. I'll say that to everybody here, and there's not a lot here. We lost half the group in this read this morning. And, and, and it's because the enemy has ground when we're getting tattoos and gutting our flesh. We're blatantly disobeying the word of God. You know, yeah, grace gives us forgiveness. But if you know something, you know, I, I know so many people, if they could relive their life, 
I know a lot of people that are trying to get tattoos taken off of them now, you know, but God doesn't look at the tattoo anymore. He looks at the person's heart. And, and that's where your faith and your, your whole being is. And there's not one of us that can look at anybody's heart and judge them. We judge people sometimes by the outward fruit, but sometimes that's the enemy operating in them and they've never confessed sins or they've never put their faith in Jesus Christ and they've never gotten any kind of deliverance, people. And in the spiritual man or woman, you can understand that. You know, the, the plague that broke out, uh, let me go through the reading here. I've gone into more detail regarding the clean and unclean. The diet which God gave his people was more than a religious ritual. There was actually a physical benefit from the observation. Well, the Seventh-day Adventists have a very strong walk with the, uh, the diet in the Old Testament. I, I worked with people that believed in doing the diet in the Old Testament, you know, and I don't argue with people. I always say, well, God told us to pray over our food and no deadly poison would hurt us, you know. Either way, you got to walk by faith. The writer wrote about a plague in Europe. The Jewish population was hardly touched by the plague at all, while a large percentage of Gentile uh, population died. This is all in history books. We are living in a day of diets. And this is a modern commentary written in the last 50 years. Everyone seems to be interested in diet today. God has not given specific dietary laws for you and me. It makes no difference whether we eat meat or don't eat meat as far as our relationship with God is concerned. However, our relationship is to be concerned because we have to follow God in some way, some respect. He's given us the word. You may stay in the world a little longer, and if you don't, it may get you into his presence a little sooner. In other words, less of the things of the world, more of the things of the spirit. And he will make it clear what animals are included and what are excluded. You know, the second mark is about clean animals. It, they were the chewing of the cud. The spiritual lesson here is that we should spend time in the word of God. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate on day and night. That was in the first psalm. That was David. That was where we would get our delight. So where's our delight? It's in the word of the Lord. And in that first verse in Psalm 1, he says, blessed is the man. So, you know, I, I read that psalm frequently in my life. When I turn to the book of Psalms, it always reminds me that God's blessed me. He's revealed his son to me and that my journey could be less in, in a hiccup and more into listening and trusting and obeying God's word. See, when you, when you obey God's word, you're really obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. The blessed man delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it. The word meditate has the idea of chewing the cud. I already said that a little while back. It goes into one chamber of the stomach in the heat of the day. The cow lays down under a tree or stands in the shade and chews her cud, which transfers that grass from one chamber to another. Chewing the cud is rechewing the grass, going over it again. That is why we are to be that way with the word of God. We're to go over it and over it, meditating on it. And, and what happens with the unclean animals? The commentary says, it says to meet these two requirements, some chew the cud, but do not have the divided hoof. The pig has the divided hoof, but it doesn't chew the cud. Such animals were designated as unclean and were not to be eaten. And there's a lot of people that are Old Testament followers. I know plenty of them. They won't eat pork. And that's the truth. I've had Christians get mad at me 
when I revealed to them that what they were eating in a restaurant had some pork in it, you know, and that's just, you know, thank God for grace. That's all I can say. The New Testament is totally different than us trying to follow every tittle of the law. And that, that's what I try to stand on the most, that I'm saved, I'm saved by grace. And, and all we're supposed to be doing is learning how to love one another, love God, and forgive one another. That, that takes care of the whole book. You care about another person's life, their being. And, you know, I, God promises throughout Scripture to bless his people in, in many different ways. Even material, sometimes he blesses us if we serve him. And in the end here, this read this morning, God himself, he says, out of the blessing, they were to tithe to the Lord from the produce of the land, as well as from their flocks. This tithe was to be eaten before the Lord at the place of the sanctuary. This would be a special feasting before the Lord. That's how simple and how the original tithe was set up by God to care for his people. And, and when it said, thou shalt bestow that money, let me turn the page, because I looked at this this morning. It said God had told them that if they would obey him, there would be no poor in the land. Why? Because the people that were getting blessed were giving a little to help take care of the people that weren't blessed. And, and part of the blessing of God, brothers and sisters, is trusting God. And in the New Testament, the Pharisees gave 10%. He called them devils. But he called the widow who gave from nothing blessed. And, and I don't go beyond that, because in, in Corinthians, Paul says God loves a cheerful giver. You give whatever you put into your heart to give. There's no bondage in the New Testament. And I get so tired of listening to pastors today telling people they're cursed for not giving. Well, we're in a, a world today where the, the principles of the world are even in the United States, they have welfare. They have, they basically have a system set up to help the poor. That no matter what, you'll get enough little bit of money and food programs to supply your nutritional needs. Anything beyond that is a lust. You know, we're we're to be content one day at a time, and yet a lot of people are not content that they're breathing. And living, and how about the fact that we're saved? We belong to God. Now, do you don't think God, who can feed the birds of the air, can take care of his children? And there's a lot of meat in discussing this at any time. He tells us that we will always have poor people in the land. You remember that the Lord Jesus said the same thing in John 12, 8. The poor always you will have with you. There will always be poverty because of the heart of man. Let me read that again. The poor always you will have with you. John 12, 8. There will always be poverty because of the heart of man. Candidly, many are lazy. Many people are shiftless and have no incentive. Remember what I said in the beginning, some people, uh, I'll see you tomorrow, and you never see that person, or they never do what they're going to say. That's what the word would refer to here, being lazy, many are shiftless, and have no in incentive. On the other hand, those who are able will normally help the poor, and you think about that. Those are the people that are cheerful givers. And God looks at our hearts. He knows what we do. Even 
in what measure you measure, it shall be measured to you. If if you want things to go right in your life, sometimes you got to practice benevolence toward other people. You know, maybe they're not walking with God the way you're walking, and God is blessing you. And and God always gives it when you're paying attention to the word of God and doing God's word, brothers and sisters, you always have extra, extra clothes, extra anything. I mean, I look at it, on the other hand, those who are able will not normally help the poor. So you got two kinds of people in the world. It's not natural for a man to do that. It's supernatural for a man to share what he has with the less fortunate. That's why charity covers a multitude of sins. Therefore, he commands his people, thou shalt open thy hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, to the needy, in thy hand. Slaves were to be freed in the Old Testament at the end of the seventh year. Today, in our country, your debt can be dispersed every seven years. That's part of the law of the land here. I haven't changed that yet. In other words, you can walk into a courtroom and get all your debt absolved, thrown out, and you get a brand new start. It came out of the word of God, people. You know, it also says uh, you're going to learn tomorrow about slavery a little more. We we see back in Exodus 21 that a man could sell himself as a slave if his master had given him a wife, that is a girl who is the master's slave. When the sabbatical year came, the man could go free. So it's, it's God's principles being put into action in real time. It even went as far as that when you stay with his wife, his children become a permanent slave of his master. Then his ear, back in uh, uh, Exodus, would be pierced, and he would be a permanent slave. This is a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, was made into the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Jesus could have gone out free. He owed no debt of sin. He was no sinner. He had no penalty to pay, but he loved us. He gave himself for us, just as the servant had his ear thrust by the uh, all, by the all. When it, the, the slave master pierced him, my ears has thou now opened, Psalm 40, verse 6. The book of Hebrews takes the same passage from Psalm 40 and says, that's why I'm reading this. You know, it'll be up on the internet and people can hear this, and maybe they'll get a little deeper understanding of what salvation is. Because he, he was pierced in his body for our transgressions, Hebrews 10, 5. The Lord Jesus took on himself a human body that he could be crucified for you and for me. It is one of those remarkable pictures which we find of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And in concluding this morning... I'll finish with this. Thomas Nelson, the children of the Lord must not be like the people of the world. The basic meaning of the Hebrew word translated holy to be different. We are God's people, so therefore we are different. We are peculiar, brothers and sisters. Although the Jewish dietary code does not apply God's, to God's people today, Remember, we're in the New Testament today. You look at that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. That's the New Testament, and, and that's what we're supposed to live by, brothers and sisters. 
the spiritual principle remains we must be separated and obedient people. The list of clean and unclean foods reminds us that the people must learn to distinguish between what God accepts and what God rejects. And, and, and the commentary says, go back to Leviticus 11 and reread 41 through 47. So, you know, you really want to do the, the Bible study of Deuteronomy 14. You got to just listen to these scripture locations and go into it. We should glorify God in what we receive. That means everything we have, we can use to glorify God and also in what we give. A tithe was 10% of their produce, which could be used as a sacrifice for joyful feasting before the Lord. A special tithe every third year supported the Levites and helped the poor. So they took that special offering every three years. It's written. We read it. God wrote it to us. It's established. But always remember what I said earlier here in this part of my teaching this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. And as a, a Bible-believing Christian, that's New Testament, and that's what we need to focus because we're New Testament saints saved by the shed blood. For the remission of our sins by our Lord Jesus Christ. In our receiving and in our giving, we should glorify God and be joyful to serve him. And you can see that quote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So once again, I pray in our prayer group that somebody hears the message, somebody gleans from the message, and God bless you all today in Jesus' name. Amen.